All right, here's your first U.S. History Flip the Classroom lesson. We're going to start out talking about goal 12. And with goal 12, we're going to start with objective 12.02, .02, talking about impact of recent constitutional amendments, court rulings, and federal legislation. First off, we're going to talk about some recent changes to the Supreme Court. Um, now, we know we've talked about how the most recent addition was Sonia Sotomayor, added by Barack Obama. But in the 1980s, the court obviously took a little bit more of a conservative swing with Ronald Reagan as president. Because, you know, the court and its um, new appointees usually have reflect the political affiliations of the current president. So in 1981, Sandra Day O'Connor was appointed by Ronald Reagan. She began as a very conservative judge, but she eventually became one of what they call the moderate block of the court. So she kind of shifted more towards the middle. And then in 1993, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was appointed and she was appointed by Bill Clinton so obviously coming from Bill Clinton she would have a little bit more of a liberal lean. Um, in the 1980s though there was a lot of debate over some of Reagan's appointees. Um, Antonin Scalia you see on the screen was appointed in 1986. Uh, Robert Bork was somebody that Ronald Reagan tried to appoint but he was rejected. You know the Supreme Court nominees have to go through a approval process by the Senate and the Senate rejected his nomination for a couple of reasons. One, they thought that he was too conservative. He is a very, very conservative man, or was. He's recently passed away. Um, but also, he was tied to the Nixon White House. If you remember, we talked about the Watergate scandal and what we call the Saturday Night Massacre, where Ken, um, Nixon kept ordering people fired. Well, Bork was the guy that finally did Nixon's dirty work in firing people. And then another justice added to the court by Reagan was Justice Anthony Kennedy. Um, another big confirmation hearing debate came up in 1991 when George H.W. Bush nominated Clarence Thomas. Um, and you see there I've messed up in the slide. Should say, shouldn't say that he was nominated in 1991 to replace Clarence Thomas. But a lot of people found him objectionable because he did not support affirmative action. The belief that businesses and universities and um, or other organizations should focus more on recruiting and hiring and enrolling minorities to kind of make up for past um, mistakes. So the, even though he was an African-American justice, he was more of a conservative justice. Um, and a lot of the African-American community didn't like that view. Also, I've got down there at the bottom of the slide, Anita Hill with a question mark. Um, there was a former law clerk named Anita Hill who came out and accused him of sexually harassing her, which made the process a little more difficult to get him approved, but he was eventually added to the Supreme Court. Um, as far as court decisions that really affected and changed things, first one I'm going to discuss there is Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. Um, this was a 1971 decision that said that, and that is Charlotte Mecklenburg from North Carolina, Mecklenburg County. It said that it was okay to bus children back and forth to make integrated school districts. We talked about de jure and de facto segregation. We said that de facto segregation is when you have um, like an all white neighborhood, a mostly black neighborhood, a mostly Hispanic neighborhood. Well, obviously, if those neighborhoods develop like that, then schools would develop into mostly white schools, mostly black schools, mostly Hispanic schools, or um, whatever races live in those neighborhoods. Well, Charlotte Mecklenburg tested this by shipping kids across town to make each school more racially integrated. And there's still a big debate today. Um, I know up until a few years ago, Wake County, and I, don't, I haven't followed the case recently, they were having a lot of debate among their school board over whether or not to bus kids to uh, make each school more racially integrated. Um, there are a lot of private schools founded in the early 1970s, just after this court decision, and a lot of them are kind of nicknamed white flight schools, because after busing, they were kind of founded by white parents that didn't want their children to go to school with minority children. Um, the next law you got there says Title IX. For those of you who don't know your Roman numerals, that one X is nine. Uh, this is, I've got that outlaw gender discrimination in school programs and activities. And the intent of the law is very good. You know, um, as a coach in Pitt County, we have to keep all kinds of meticulous records to make sure that we're treating female male athletes the same. Uh, and Title IX is most often applied to school athletics. And you look at this cartoon, um, it's got a college football player sitting on top of the big money bag, says it's Title IX's fault. Well, 
guy with the tennis racket walks out the door. Unfortunately, that's what some colleges have started doing because Title IX requires they spend as much scholarship money on women's sports as men's sports. You know, football takes up a ton of scholarship money for a lot of schools. So a lot of schools, rather than adding women's sports, which would cost a lot more to keep things equal, they're cutting some of the non-revenue men's sports. So, like, um, I know the University of Miami has cut, like, men's swimming. Um, some colleges that had rowing as a varsity men's sport have cut those. Um, just within the last six or seven years, East Carolina cut men's soccer as a varsity program. Um, all stay Title IX compliant. Um, I know, I believe several years ago, our county actually had to face a Title IX lawsuit dealing with, like, lights, where one school did not have lights on the softball field, but they did have lights on the baseball field. you got to prove that we're treating everybody equitable, each gender equitable. Um, the next case we're looking at here is Texas versus Johnson. This uh, was a 1989 case saying that burning the American flag is a protected and legal form of free speech. Um, so you know your First Amendment rights give you freedom of speech. Well, this case said that even if you go out and peacefully protest and you burn an American flag, that's protected. And you see our cartoon there has somebody burning a hippie um, with a flag on his butt, which was a thing that hippies would try to do if you have ever seen Forrest Gump. You know the speaker when Forrest runs across the water and hugs Jenny in Washington, D.C. Um, the speaker's wearing an American flag for a shirt, which was not supposed to be patriotic. It was actually supposed to be a form of disrespect to the flag. Um, then next, we've got the Americans with Disabilities Act, passed under the Bush administration in 1990, said that all public buildings and public transportation had to provide access to people with disabilities. Also, you cannot um, discriminate in hiring somebody just because of a um, disability. Um, we talked in the late 1800 period about a lot of trust and how Teddy Roosevelt in the early 1900s was nicknamed the trust buster for trying to use the Sherman Antitrust Act to break up some of these monopolies. Well, this still goes on today. Um, in 1998, Microsoft was charged with being a monopoly by stifling competition because they combined their Internet Explorer browser with their operating system. Um, the company was ordered to break up. Um, they appealed, got there, the decision was overturned, the conviction stood, and um, in part, this case is why today... You know, I'm sitting here doing this recording on a MacBook. If it hadn't been for this, not many of us would probably be using things like Mac or um, any kind of other operating system other than Windows. Um, so Bill Gates, you know, he's a great businessman, but he did have to reorganize his company. Um, I've got a few amendments in this section, too. Right here we've got the 26th Amendment said that you can vote when you're 18 years old. And the logic for that, this was passed during the Vietnam War, was that if the government can draft you to fight and die for your country when you're 18, and you should be able to select the leaders who are instituting the draft. Um, 27th Amendment is the most recent one. Uh, you see, I've got there, it was proposed all the way back in 1789, um, soon after the Constitution was ratified, but it wasn't ratified until 1992. But it says that Congress may vote itself a pay raise, but if Congress does vote itself a pay raise, this does not take effect until the next, um, I've got the next turn, I mean the next congressional session, or after the next election. So basically, if you get mad that your congressional leaders vote themselves a pay raise, you can vote them out of office so that someone else is receiving that pay raise. Uh, for 12.03, we've got to identify and assess the impact of economic, technological, and environmental changes in the United States. Obviously, within the last 20 or 30 years, which is what Goal 12 covers, we've had a lot of technological changes. Um... But all the way back to the 70s, people were already trying to figure out what could we do to use our resources more efficiently. You know, both Romney and Obama in their campaigns talked about how were we going to um, make a, America less dependent on foreign oil. And every now and then you hear environmentalists talk about um, what can we do to save our natural resources. Um, if you paid much attention to Al Gore when he was big in politics, he was very big environmentalist, so he was big on this stuff. But Jimmy Carter creates the Department of Energy to try to figure out how we can do this as a country. And one way that people do this was solar energy. You see there we got a picture of a bunch of solar panels out in the desert. Um, they can store solar energy. Um, I think Al Gore actually had a huge, um, a huge financial cost to himself, made the house he owned in Tennessee um, completely solar-powered. 
Um, right here you see NAFTA. And in that little graphic, we have Canada, the United States, and Mexico. NAFTA stands for North American Free Trade Agreement, and that was an agreement between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, which was supposed to lower trade barriers. Um, this was under the Clinton administration. A lot of people didn't like the Clinton administration and didn't like this agreement, called it that great sucking sound. Actually, that's what Ross Perot called it. He said it was going to suck American jobs out of Mexico. Um, originally, part of the intent of this was to kind of bring the whole North American continent up to a higher standard of living, but a lot of jobs did um, go into Mexico, and then a lot of those jobs left Mexico and have now gone to places like China. Um, next, I've got Three Mile Island. This is a partial nuclear meltdown at a power plant in Pennsylvania. And nuclear energy is a big, hot topic just because of whether or not it is safe. And if you uh, remember the tsunami in Japan a couple years ago, or was it an earthquake? They had the um, nuclear reactors melted down. And if you watch The Simpsons, um, Homer, you know, he works at a nuclear power plant. He falls asleep at the star show and starts a nuclear meltdown. Well, what happens in The Simpsons in cartoon life? is what actually happened at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. Alright, and then in the standard course of study, you're supposed to know who Bill Gates is. Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, and you know he's actually a college dropout. He did attend Harvard, but he didn't finish. Um, I read a really interesting book on Steve Jobs this summer, and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, you know, they were kind of friends for a while, competitors for a while, Steve Jobs being the guy that founded Apple. But I heard one time that Bill Gates made so much money, his time is so valuable, that if he was walking down the street and saw $500 laying on the sidewalk, and he bent over to pick it up, it would be a waste of his time. And that's how valuable his time is. But he's also done a lot for charitable organizations. He's a big philanthropist. Remember, philanthropy is that word we use for somebody that is giving back. All right, we talked about um, the Dow Jones Industrial Index, or well, NASDAQ in the 1990s. Um, I've got that's when the technology dominated stock index became important in the 1990s. That's kind of a number that shows how the stock market's doing. Um, then going along with our space program, 1986, our space program faced a big setback when the space shuttle Challenger blew up um, as it was launching. Um, and this set NASA back, I mean, a lot. You can. Obviously, tell it would be a huge national tragedy when our space program, which we thought was light years ahead of the rest of the world, suffers something like this. Um, during the 1980s, when Ronald Reagan was president, we also um, went through airline deregulation. Ronald Reagan cut back on federal rules about when airlines could fly, what routes they could fly, and this is good for me and you because it means more airlines get into the game, um, and it means they compete with each other more. So we get lower prices for airline tickets now. But Ronald Reagan was big on not getting too involved in businesses. And along with Ronald Reagan and his economic policies, he believed in what was called supply-side economics. We talked about this with Herbert Hoover. We also call it the trickle-down theory, where um, in the 1980s it was called Reaganomics or voodoo economics. You can see there I've got that it's for lowering taxes on the wealthy. And this is something the Republicans have talked about today. And, you know, the Republicans and all this fiscal cliff debate are very hesitant to give a tax break excuse me, to a higher tax, even to millionaires. And I've got there that they hope they're going to create more jobs by business growth because the idea is that the wealthy people are the ones that own the businesses. So if you give them a tax break, eventually they're going to hire more workers and may pay their workers better. And this is going to get the economy going. So again, this is a lot of names for it. It's called supply-side economics, Reaganomics, trickle-down economics, or voodoo economics. And like I said, it's the same thing that Herbert Hoover believed in at the start of the Great Depression. Now, Reagan had a lot of admirers. He also had a lot of detractors. And this um, kind of demotivational cartoon I found on the internet, it's got Reagan. There's Reagan right here. And there's George Bush laughing with some of their um, friends and saying, Reaganomics, we told them the wealth would trickle down. Ha, ha, ha. Acting like they knew all along this wouldn't work, which obviously that this is a very cynical person that created this. That's not how I feel. Um, and then this cartoon's from another person that would have had the kind of same view. So you got Uncle Sam up here um, urinating on the homeless, says we'll work for food, implying that trickle-down economics doesn't work. And then with this one, you've got kind of the same idea. It says they said if the rich got tax cuts, they'd use money to create jobs. You got tax cuts, I am creating jobs there in China, implying that these tax cuts 
kept the wealthy people rich, but they're sending jobs to China instead.